artificial intelligence, for years a dream of scientists and Hollywood producers, but also the violent and destructive stuff of our nightmares. My name is Gemma Chan. I play a robot in the futuristic sci-fi drama Humans. As the development of artificial intelligence accelerates and starts to pervade every aspect of our lives, I'm hoping to find out whether the world depicted in science fiction is 10 years away, 100 years away, or closer than we think. I'm going to meet some of the greatest minds in science. They're divided. Some think AI holds the key to a safe and prosperous future. I see AI as the opportunity actually to unlock humanity's full potential. Others think the nightmare may just be about to begin. We're worried that this will come out too soon. People will die. Once you have a kind of super intelligent genie that's out of the bottle, it might not be possible to put it back in again. To see just how far we can take the power of AI, we're conducting a unique experiment, building a robot version of me. This is really the first time we've tried this, so it's very, very new. It's really quite uncanny. A robot that looks like me is one thing. It's, it's my nose. But can it harness the power of artificial intelligence to actually think like me? I like the taste of cheese. <laughs> Can we build a human? It's so strange. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Day one of the robot build, and we need a body to house its brain. Welcome to Millennium Effects. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Millennium FX is one of Europe's leading suppliers of prosthetics, animatronics, and specialist makeup. Oh my goodness. This is something that we do a lot at Millennium. You know, babies come up in TV shows a lot, but you can't film on babies for very long. So we produce these lifelike babies so that people can hold them. It's just so weird. So the closer something is to looking human, the weirder it feels. It's what we call the uncanny valley, where your mind kind of knows, it kind of knows that no matter how perfect something is, no matter how good the movement is or how realistic it looks, your mind knows that there's something not quite right. I think I'm just gonna put, put her down. Making a silicon duplicate will enable the robot builders to create a lifelike skin. A, E, I, O, U. My double will need to have hundreds of facial expressions, just like me and they'll need to be in sync with what the artificial brain is thinking. Hi, lovely to meet you. Time for me to get my face copied. Gemma, we're going to have you uh, 3D scanned. Kate Walsh is the producer in charge. Today we're going to try and watch you as closely as possible and uh, you know, see if we can pick up on all the subtle uh, expressions and movements of your face. I'm intrigued to see how far we can go and how, um, how lifelike can make it. I really have no idea what to expect. Uh, three, two, one, scan. It's so cool. Uh, this is the room where we'll be doing your head cast, and on the wall behind you are some of the people <laughs> who had the pleasure of live casting before. Uh, is that Gordon Ramsay there? Yes. It is, yes. yes. <laughs> that's it, perfect. And if you just want to open your mouth just a fraction and just blow out gently, that's it. Keep your eyes nice and relaxed. That's it. doing fantastically. The cast consists of two different types of silicon and is finished off with a traditional plaster shell. One, two, three. Great shot. Well done. The whole process needs to be quick, as after 20 minutes the heat becomes intolerable. I'm going to whip that off. That's great. I mean, it's a great cast. You did really, really, really well. Great, thank you. While the team will need to turn silicon into something that resembles me, a bigger challenge will be to create its mind. For that, the robot needs artificial intelligence. Defined by computer scientists as a machine having the capability to make a human-like decision. Thank you so much for agreeing to no, talk no, to us today. Sorry. Oxford Professor of Philosophy Nick Bostrom is one of the world's leading experts in AI. So the goal of AI, artificial intelligence, has all along since its beginnings in the 50s been to make machines that have the same general purpose smartness uh, that we humans have, that can do all the things that the human brain can do. From smartphones to share prices, 
from online customer support to CCTV, we're now surrounded by so much of it, we started to take it for granted. AI is a general purpose technology. You can go through any sector in the economy, you can go through healthcare, entertainment, medicine, defense, you name it. You could think of ways in which processes could be improved by being smarter. Machines are being developed as soldiers, mastering real-time translations using the latest in word recognition software. Can you hear me in French? Pouvez-vous me entendre en français? <laughs> and AI could soon have a significant role in the legal system. An AI judge that was shadowing cases from the European Court of Human Rights recently came up with the same decision as the human judge in four out of five cases. The medical profession is also making use of it. These Canadian scientists have recently been to the UK to sell an AI diagnostic tool that they say can identify a tumour instantly and accurately, without the need for a biopsy and with immediate results. Just like a human, the machine got trained on multiple thousands of images uh, to get an accuracy level. Not only is it less invasive and quicker, but it could save the NHS millions of pounds if introduced. Some of us are already entrusting our lives to AI. This is the Tesla Model S, on the market for a cool £100,000. Noel Sharkey is an academic specialising in AI and is interested in how autonomous decision-making will affect us all. You're going to take your hands off? I've arranged to meet him on a test track to try out one of the car's most impressive features. The ability to drive itself using artificial intelligence. Right, the hands are coming off. Come on, then. The hands are off. Whoa. We're approaching a bend. Oh. oh my goodness. Oh. See that? It, it nearly took us off the road there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know this is meant to be a less stressful driving experience. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> like, it, I'm sweating. I'm yeah, sweating. Of course, yeah. I'm sweating. Oh my goodness. Right. You try being the passenger. <laughs> <laughs> Semi autonomous cars like this are, are really quite controversial, especially in the field of robotics. Mm -hmm. And we really need much broader societal debate. The UK government's rolling out autonomous cars and they haven't really debated as to whether people want it or not. This controversy has been fueled by drivers in America, ignoring the company's safety guidelines and uploading outrageous clips to the internet. But I think that what puts it all in perspective is the recent fatal crash in the USA. Yes, I remember hearing something about that in, in the news. Earlier this year, a driver crashed and died allegedly whilst watching a Harry Potter film. His car hit the underside of a trailer at 74 miles per hour. It pulled out right in front of it, bright white trailer, bright white sky, very sunny, and the camera couldn't detect the trailer, and that's why it ran into it. And I suppose that the more autonomous vehicles you have on the road, they're, you know, the likelihood of, of incidents like that, or accidents, you know, they're, they're bound to happen. It's measuring the space now with its sensors, I think. But while Tesla say AI cars will have fewer accidents, wow. ultimately, we won't be in control. Oh, look, at, oh. look, it's correcting oh. itself as well. So you imagine what's going to happen when they really are fully autonomous, because you're going to have to delegate all your driving decisions to them. Life and death decisions. It could well be life and death decisions. Well, look, do you see this fan coming down here? Well, we're just driving along here on that side in this direction. The van comes hammering at us for some reason. And you've got that woman there in a pushchair, and she's going to be hit if we avoid it. The car has to make a decision to take the hit or to kill the mother and baby. What would you do? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I would do in that split second. I, yeah, that's I think it's a really, that's a really difficult decision for, for anyone to make, for a human to make. How can a car decide which life is well, more valuable? I don't think it should, myself. 
The robot we're building won't need to make life and death decisions. But it will have to harness AI's decision-making powers to think like me. It's being built on a modest industrial estate on the outskirts of Penryn, Cornwall. I wasn't expecting the, uh, the hub of the robot build to be next to a b and I'm wondering if it's going to be a, a mop head. <laughs> Will Jackson is at the forefront of constructing human-like robots. Will, hello. Hello. To be convincing, robots need to reason, learn and understand so they can react almost instinctively like us. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? He's thinking about it. Very well, thank you. He's great. He's very much a robot. You definitely know that this is a machine, not a person. He's pretty limited. Will plans to apply the knowledge acquired building Robo Thespian RT4 as a basis for constructing the AI version of me. In order to be convincing, the robot will need to master the complexity of language. So the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to speak to the robot. We've got microphones in their ears, pick up the sound. At that point, it's just sound. It doesn't mean anything. So we have to turn the sound into words, into text. Once we've got the sound as text, we've got to try and find the meaning. What, what is this person actually saying to me? What's the key word? What did they ask about? And once we've got that meaning, we have to try and think of a sensible reply. We have to then turn that back into speech. So we're going to have to take a user-generated version of your voice that sounds like you. While we're doing all of this, the robot can't just sit still. So it has to have all the little actions that you would have, the way you listen, the way you think about what somebody's going to say, the way you think about what you're going to say. You've got to get all these little subtle things right all at the same time. The brain in this robot has got to come up with an answer that makes sense, even when it's never heard the question before. It's a huge challenge, and, and we have so many things to get right. Will's going to use his existing robot hardware to test out the speech recognition software that he plans to use on the robot me. There's an old saying in computer programming, it's garbage in, garbage out. If the robot cannot recognise what you're saying, if it just gets one or two words in a sentence wrong when you speak, what you get back is complete gibberish. Using speech recognition software, can it recognise words it hears, turn them into text, and then accurately repeat them? Echo on. OK, echo on. Peter Piper picked a piece of pickled pepper, put it on a panda car, drove it around the moon, and ate a sausage on the way home. Peter Piper picked a piece of pickled pepper, put it on a pan, took our dragons, random name generator sausage on the way home. <laughs> random name generator sausage. Part of the challenge is to get our robot to respond as quickly as a human would. That's within a tenth of a second. Hello. Hello. Too slow. Hello. Hello. It's too slow. To respond as fast as a human, the robot needs to work out what's being said and what it means before the end of a sentence and reply with a lightning-fast response, which involves instinct, like us. We've got to be so quick with understanding what's being said that we can be replying before even really the last words come out. So it's got to be super fast. Building a machine that can understand a human and answer back convincingly is one of the toughest challenges in AI. If I speak quicker, does it work better? If I speak quicker, does it work better? It's almost fast enough. It's almost there, but it's not quite. If we can't get the recognition that quick, blown it. I'm a robot. We're testing the boundaries of science with a unique artificial intelligence test. Building a robot that looks, sounds, and thinks like me. The robot team is progressing well, but it's my facial expressions that are proving hard for the robot to sync with its brain. It's quite a scary looking thing at the moment, but uh, once it's got the rest of the core that goes on, which has got the top teeth in it, uh, and then the skin will go over the top, it will start to look a lot more like Gemma. The physical part of the build is tricky, 
but it's the robot's ability to converse like a human that's really going to test our engineers. With Moore's law stating that computer processing power doubles every two years, artificially intelligent achievements in the real world have been accelerating fast. In the 1950s, computers beat us at noughts and crosses. Then in the 1990s, they beat us at chess. Those computers were programmed to work out all the possible outcomes of each move and then weighed up how each move would contribute to a winning strategy. But we're now entering an age when computers aren't just programmed, but can learn for themselves. Computers like IBM's Watson. This is Jeopardy! The IBM Challenge! In 2011, Watson was put up to one of the toughest challenges ever, a general knowledge quiz that requires logic and quick thinking. This is Jeopardy. It's a bit of an American institution. It's a general knowledge quiz program, and they ask questions in a really strange way. They give you the answer, and you have to work out what the question is. Duncan Anderson is IBM's European Chief Technology Officer for Watson. So we've got the two best players here. We've got the person who won the most amount of money on the show and the person who has the longest winning streak. Two of the most brilliant brains had won $5 million between them. This game was worth another million. Watson itself is not connected to the internet, so it's not right. out there searching. It's their standalone playing against these champion players. It was a big risk. The category is 19th century novelists, and here is the clue. William Wilkinson's An Account of the Principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia inspired this author's most famous novel. Who is Bram Stoker? Hello. And this is the point where Watson's won. We've beat the best human players at Jeopardy. So how exactly do you program a, a machine to do something that it's never done before? Well, the first thing is you don't program it. Trying to guess every single question that might come up and then program the computer with the right answer for that question, we would be here forever. So we use this thing called machine learning, which is uh, an approach to solving problems whereby the machine can learn from experiences. So we took Watson and we taught it, we fed it lots of information. Uh, for example, uh, back issues of Time magazine, Wikipedia, encyclopedias. So Watson was, was learning, in a way. Mm. And then we go through a teaching process, just like you would teach a child. We're teaching Watson, and we're testing it, and we're giving it feedback when it gets it right, and feedback when it gets it wrong. And then it adjusts its approach to making decisions. You could think of it a bit like um, trying to find a pathway through a field. So you have a very faint, distinct path that maybe only one person has trodden through. And what you're trying to do is to feed information so that that pathway becomes more defined. As more people go down that path, the path gets more trodden through and becomes more obvious. So the more data that you feed into Watson, it's almost like the, the more or the wider the path becomes or the more exactly. distinct the path becomes. Precisely. So Watson becomes more confident that that pathway is the right pathway to take. We now need my robot to undergo a basic version of this process. It needs its own pathway and be fed hundreds of bespoke new rules on how to respond to a question and then learn how to use them. Ready to go now? Do you want to try the, try the latest chat script from Bruce? OK. Uh, key moment. Will has commissioned one of the world's leading computer programmers to build a chatbot a piece of software which simulates human conversation and responds with the answer it thinks I would give. Do you like repetition? Yes. Do you like repetition? You said that already. Aha! Now that's the kind of reply I'm looking for. That's what I want to get to. That was good. You're improving. Right. How about we talk about work? You've played a lot of supernatural characters. Are you a fan of the genre, or is it just a coincidence? I do love science fiction and things that explore the boundaries of the possible. Oh. But actually, having a bunch of roles in that genre is just a coincidence. The team has certainly done their homework. 
Just as Watson was fed information from previous Jeopardy games, our chatbot has been fed interviews and background information on me. Once we can get the expressions and all those other little subtle cues, movement things in there, I think it will start to come together. Fantastic. Yeah, it will be fantastic. Are you sure? I'm positive. What's your next question? The next question is how to make it sound like me. Hello. Hello. I'm Gemma. Nice to the meet human you. voice has a huge variation of inflection, pitch and intonation. Our robot will need to replicate the essence of my voice, with all the specific quirks that make it unique to me. Uh, so just keep in mind that when you get commas, you make a small pause. Boodil Matteson is a computational linguist and works for a company that specialises in synthesised voices. It's not the words that you're recording here, it's more, you're more interested in the different sounds that I'm making. Yeah, I'm not interested in words at all, I'm interested in the combinations of phonemes that we are getting. With the phonemes, yeah. oh I see. So the combinations of sounds. How many sentences do I need to record? <laughs> well, in the end it's about 1400 sentences. 1400? Yeah. Today? This is going to be quite a long afternoon. <laughs> I certainly have appreciated that outlet for my creativity. Imagine George Bush singing in the shower. Uh, you will have to do the previous one again. We're teaching our robot how to speak like me. You are an athlete if you play golf. But in the future, we may get to a stage where it can teach itself, learning from experience and coming up with its own solutions, which is what AIs are starting to do. Hi. Hi, you doing? Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Thanks. So, welcome to the offices. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. So, uh... Demis Hassabis was a child chess prodigy from North London. It's actually quite a strange meeting you because I watched you on being pretending to be a, an AI. Yeah. <laughs> In 2011, he launched a British artificial intelligence company called DeepMind. Just three years later, Google bought his company for £400 million. One of the first things we got our programme to do was to play classic Atari games. And we wanted the AI to actually learn to play these games by just from the pixels on the screen and no other information. So it had to learn for itself what the rules of the game were, how to get points, and how to sort of master the game. The idea behind Breakout is that you control a bat and a ball, and you've got to break out through a rainbow-coloured wall, brick by brick. I think I remember this from, from when from I was younger, yeah. Atari. yeah. So you can see it's starting to get the hang of what it should do. It's not very good, so it misses the ball quite a lot, but it's starting to understand that it's got to move the bat towards the ball if it wants to get points. This is after 300 games, there's still not that many. Uh, so we thought this is pretty good, but what would happen if we just let the programme continue to play the game? So we left it playing for another 200 games, and then we came back and it did this amazing strategy of uh, digging a tunnel around the side of the wall and actually sending the ball around the back. So that's really amazing. amazing. It's discovered it for itself, and obviously can do it at, you know, with, with superhuman precision. Then last year, Demis and his team built a computer program to play the most complex game ever devised, an ancient Chinese game called Go. The aim of the game in Go is to either capture your opponent's pieces or to surround areas of the board and make it your territory. In chess, the board is made up of an 8x8 grid. This means the number of possible moves in a game can be number crunched by a computer. With a 19x19 19 -19 board, Go is a much more complex game. Even the best players, they use their intuition and their instincts more than calculation. Astonishingly, the number of possible moves is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. So even if you took all the world's computing power and ran it for a million years, that would still not be enough to brute force a solution to how to win Go. So Demis gave a more powerful computer the same challenge it gave the Atari computer five years before. Could it teach itself how to play the world's most complex board game and beat the world's best player? Earlier this year, Demis took the computer program he'd named AlphaGo to Korea to play the world champion. Well, there was actually a genuine sort of um, excitement and, and sort of fear about what was actually going to happen. 
the man on the right is making the moves on behalf of AlphaGo. Ooh. That's a very that's Ooh. a very surprising move. <laughs> I thought I thought it was I thought it was a mistake. AlphaGo played a move that was just completely unthinkable uh, for a human to play. So there's two important lines in Go. If you play on the third line, you're trying to take territory on the side of the board. If you play on the fourth line, you're trying to take influence into the centre of the board. And what AlphaGo did is it played on the fifth line. And, and um, you never do that in the position that it played in. And we were actually quite worried because obviously at that point, we didn't know if this was a, you know, a crazy move or a, you know, a brilliant original move. And then 50 moves later, that move ended up joining up with another part of the board. So it and works. sort of magically just yeah, resulting in helping it win the game. Demis's AI made headlines around the world when it won the match. We're not there yet, but in the next you know few years, we would like to get to the point where you could give it any data, um, scientific, medical, or commercial, and it would find these structures or these patterns that perhaps human experts have missed um, and highlight those so that um, improvements can be made. Yeah. I think what's really interesting about it is the fact that this program can teach itself. It can learn from its mistakes. It can come up with a genuinely creative solution to a problem. And, and really, you can apply that to anything. So if we can give my robot the ability to learn for itself, who knows where it might take us? It's so strange. We're testing the boundaries of science with a unique artificial intelligence test building a robot that looks, sounds, and thinks like me. The team is working on getting the robot's facial expressions to work in tandem with the AI. If you look at other robots of this type, this kind of flexible silicon face robot, this is bloody good. Look at me. Look at me. Oh, spooky. <laughs> the heart of the robot is conversation that seems real. And the software to do this, the chatbot, has just arrived. Hello. My name is Gemma Chan. I'm not a robot. That sounds like Gemma, doesn't it? I think it sounds like Gemma. <laughs> do you think? I think that sounds like Gemma. But it's proving a real challenge to synchronise the body with the mind. When we can get all of the axes going at the same time, it'll look really good. Hopefully, the robot will be able to pick the right expression for the right thought. This is the first stored pose, and it's a little smile. That's awesome. I like the look of that. Will is teaching the robot 180 of the most common movements. I think she's happy. Hoping she'll choose the right ones to react and be convincing as a human. Gemma now knows how to smile forever, and she will be able to seamlessly blend from one smile to a frown to anger to despair and the whole range of human emotions, but we have to teach her them. If we can teach AI almost anything that involves reasoning and decision-making, once it has those skills, what might be the consequences? God, we're high. This is the London Gateway Dockyard. Every day, over 20,000 containers are moved by a highly complex AI, which controls the logistics and timings of what happens when and where. I can only see about five people. Just 10 years ago, a port of this size would have employed thousands of workers to shift these containers. Today, many of the 500 employees spend their time supervising the AI machines. The AI is incredibly efficient, moving the containers in the fewest number of moves. Like a very basic AlphaGo, it comes up with solutions faster than any human would be able to. Wow, that's a lot of containers. AI expert and writer Martin Ford thinks what we're seeing here reflects the shape of things to come. Look out at all these containers here and think of those as representing the job market in the United Kingdom and imagine 35%, roughly a, 30, a third of those disappearing and what would happen to our society and our economy if that were to happen. This is an incredible impact on all of us and on the economy. It's something that is going to be uniquely disruptive, something that we've never seen before in history. One of the things that's really driving it 
is that machines in a limited way, or at least, you know, they're beginning to think. And it's not just blue collar jobs. You may not realize this, but a lot of online journalism based on statistics, like sports and business articles, are increasingly being written by AIs. This is a corporate earnings report for Starbucks carriers, which is actually one of the companies that utilizes this port. One of these items is written by a machine, and one is written by a human journalist. I mean, just take a look and see if you can determine which is which. Yeah, so the first one, Athens, Greece. Starbuck Carriers Corporation on Wednesday reported a loss of $48.8 million in its first quarter. Sounds yeah, that pretty, sounds pretty human to me. Um, and the other one starts like this. Starbuck Carriers Corporation reported a net revenue decrease of 14.9% in the first quarter of 2016. Which one do you think is human and which one do you think is a machine? It's really hard to tell which one is written by, I, do you know? I believe the one on the right is written by a, a person and the one on the left oh, really? is written by the machine. They both sound like something that, it, that a person could have written, doesn't That's it? That's right. We are really heading toward a kind of a tipping point or a point at which things are gonna accelerate beyond anything we've seen before. This is just really historic. It's not just about muscle power anymore, it's about brain power. Machines are moving into cognitive capability. And that, of course, is the thing that really sets people apart. That's the reason that most people today still have jobs, whereas horses have been put out of work. It's because we have this ability to think, to learn, to figure out how to do new things and to solve problems. But increasingly, the machines are pushing into that area, and that's gonna have huge implications for the future. Are any jobs safe? Right now, it's really hard to build robots that can, can approach human ability and dexterity and mobility. So a lot of skilled trade type jobs, electricians and plumbers and that type of things are probably going to re be relatively safe. But that's thinking out, you know, over the next 10, 20, maybe 30 years. If once you go beyond that, really nothing is off the table. But the biggest danger may not be losing our jobs. Professor Stephen Hawking recently warned that the creation of powerful AI will be either the best or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. Hawking was recently joined by Tesla founder Elon Musk and other leading figures in an open letter, highlighting the potential dangers of unchecked AI. One of the most vocal was Professor Nick Bostrom. Developments in the last few years uh, in machine learning have just been more rapid than people expected with these deep learning uh, algorithms and so forth. How far away are we from achieving human level artificial intelligence? The media and opinion, by which year do you think there's a 50% chance? Was 2040 or 2050? But within our lifetime? Yeah, uh, within the lifetime of a lot of people alive today. The concern there is you're building this very, very powerful intelligence. And you want to be really sure then that this goal that it has is the same as your goal, that it incorporates human values in it. Because if it's not the goal that you're happy with, then you might see the world transform into something that maximizes the AI's goal, but leaves no room for you and your values. This idea of autonomous and dangerous AIs is a recurring theme in the world of science fiction. Nick thinks that super-intelligent machines could one day inhabit the real world and use their power to negative effect if we don't put the right safeguards in place. AIs could take their instructions to logical but unanticipated extremes. The concern is not that uh, these AIs would resent us or, or resent being exploited by us or that they would hate us or something, uh, but that they would be indifferent to us. So if you think maybe you have some big department store and it wants to build a new parking place, maybe there was an ant colony there before, right? So it got paved over. It's not because we hate the ants. Uh, it's just because they didn't factor into our goal. And we didn't care. Similarly, if you had a machine that wants to optimize the universe to maximize the realization of some goal, in realizing this goal, we wouldn't be kind of stomped out collateral in the damage. same way that, yeah, collateral damage. The way in which AIs can be diverted from what their architects intended played out earlier this year when Microsoft introduced Tay to Twitter. The AI persona was designed to act like an American teenager to attract a younger audience. The chatbot worked by absorbing and mimicking the language of other Twitter users, but Tay was hijacked by internet trolls who gave it a very different set of values. The original intention was corrupted and Tay was unable to work out which views were acceptable and which weren't. Within a day, Tay became a Hitler-loving racist sex pest. 
This shows what can happen to AI if it falls into the wrong hands. But could a future take do far worse? Once you have a kind of super intelligent genie that's out of the bottle, like it might not be possible to put it back in again. Like you don't want to have a super intelligent adversary that is working at cross purposes with you. That might then resist your attempts to shut it down. It's much better to get it right on the first attempt, not to build a super intelligent evil genie in the first place, right? You want to have, if you're going to have a super intelligent genie, you want it to be, to be on, on your side. side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In Cornwall, our genie is about to be let out of its bottle, and I want to know whose side it's on. Robots upstairs here. Bear in mind, this is not your final skin, so let's have a look inside. Let's just let her pee, pay. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> That's so weird. <laughs> so, it's quite warm. No, just feel it though, it's weird. Leaving the eyes. Quite right, but she, you know, I can recognise like the nose is. Well, I mean, it's yeah, it's it's my nose. I'll try asking her something. Okay, uh, what have you been up to today? We've been busy filming season two of Humans since April, and it's been very exciting. Not bad. So we can have a, a kind of guess of the sort of things people might say, so... I can't resist cheese on toast. <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? I had a toasted cheese sandwich. Is that because you can't resist cheese on toast? I like the taste of cheese. <laughs> Is that true? Do you really like cheese on toast? I love cheese, oh. yeah. So, you know, there's a little personality trait we, we might have got right. Maybe not as much as, as, as she likes cheese. Right. It's the facial expressions are not quite in sync with what she's saying. Basically, yes. there's a slight software bug. Amazing. <laughs> but don't worry too much. She's got a very clever. She's got a few. <laughs> very strange. <laughs> a few facial tics going yeah, on. Yeah, she has. But, you know, this is really the first time we've tried this. So it's very, very new. And what you'll find <laughs> is things will progress very, very quickly. Facial takes aside, the build is going well. Every day, the robot is making progress in terms of how it looks, sounds, and thinks. So we've come up with an idea to put it to the test. Hi, Gemma. Hi. Robot Gemma, do not fail. We're building an artificially intelligent robot that looks like me, talks like me, and thinks like me. And today, I'm going to meet her in her finished form. Last time I saw her, she needed quite a bit of work. So I'm hoping that that today we'll have more of a finished product. Yeah, I don't know. I'm quite nervous. Cheers. Ah! Oh no! Really strange. It's spooky, isn't it? <gasps> wow. It's really quite uncanny. In the 1950s, the visionary godfather of British computing, Alan Turing, saw forward to the days when a computer would be able to think like us, and he came up with a test. Could a bystander tell if he was talking to a machine or a person? It's known as a Turing test, and we've adapted it to try out on our own robot. This is an enormous challenge. Basically, what we're doing is taking a fictional vision of the future and trying to bring it here now. She's ready for her close-up. I've invited some journalists to come and interview her to see if they can tell it's not actually me. And we've rigged the place with hidden cameras. Thank you, Emily. Hi there. Hi. 
and I've called in a favour from Humans castmates Emily Barrington and Will Tudor to give proceedings an air of reality, and the journalists will meet them first. I'll come back and tell you we've got two minutes. Okay. All right. Before being taken into a second room, where, to give us a fighting chance, they'll interview Robot Gemma over a video call. Hey, Gemma. Hi. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. I'll be in a room down the hall, watching with the robot's creators, Will and Kate. Come in. Yeah, so but first, there's just time to introduce Robot Gemma to my castmates. Oh. oh my goodness, that's terrifying. What's extraordinary is the tiny movements in the face. Are oh. you real? Maybe. Ooh. Yeah. So with everything in place, the experiment begins. I'm so nervous. Oh, oh my God. So should I just get started and ask you questions? I live in Notting Hill. <laughs> That's very what interesting. What do you mean? Sorry? Could you say apology accepted? It's not the smoothest of starts. My name's Lareb. Got it. How are you Your doing? Your name is her. Is No, Lareb. L-A-R-E-B. Could you say that? Um, one more time. Lareb? Great. Yeah. What's your name? Thank you for coming on and Skyping. That's really nice of you. No, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. <laughs> How was season one for you? I wish I could explain it to you, but I think it is just an instinct. Oh! I think he knows. So far, Robot Gemma's responses haven't gone as well as I'd hoped. But gradually, she starts to find her train of thought. So, c tell me about Series 2. It's a keyword for Gemma Robot, Series 2. If this journalist just keeps saying Series 2, everything will go fine. It seems that the scope has um, got bigger for Series 2. The main difference is that the world of the show has, has become bigger. And what does Mia want in Series 2? Mia's trying to find her place in the world. The voice is a little bit uh, glitchy, she's, isn't she? She's going, though. She's getting in. Sort of. Do you think a synth can enjoy art? Yeah. That's a good question. Yes, especially like sculpture. Yes, good answer. Can you hear me now? Uh, yep, I can see and hear you okay. Lovely, perfect. Okay, so, um... We're short on time. No, okay, that's absolutely fine. I don't think she's clocked that she's not talking to me yet. What would you like to see a robot do? Oh, I'd love a robot to tidy my room. <laughs> What could we expect from season two? Uh, the synth characters have fragmented, in a way. Um, yes, yes. I can't tell you anything more specific about the plot, I'm afraid. Can you tell us where we find your character? Mia's not with the Hawkins family. Mia's trying to find her place in the world. We've got her. She totally believes it. And there's a new character that you spend quite a lot of time with. She's. She's perfect. What can you tell us about their relationship, if anything? I can't answer that. Jeez. She's not sure. That's, that's OK. It's OK to be evasive on that. Who's your favourite character? You, obviously. Time to meet the journalists and reveal the ruse. Hello. Hello. Hi. This is so confusing. Just how convincing was it? She looks so real. What did you have for breakfast this morning? The usual got dressed and sat at my computer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Well, I wasn't sure, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. What were the, the giveaways? The voice, maybe. It fooled me when I first sat down and looked at it. Yeah, completely fooled me. Oh, wow. It just looks like That's... a kind of not best Skype connection. <laughs> 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 how are you today? I'm very good, thank you. <laughs> did you believe you were talking to me? I did, yeah, I honestly thought it was you. <laughs> Could you say that? Um, one more time. What's really surprised me is that we've got as far as we have. There was obviously something slightly uncanny about her. 
I'm really impressed as she held her own. I don't know if anyone would be convinced by our robot, and quite a few people were for, for at least a bit. So in that sense, that's, that's success. Having set out to find out how far we are from the unsettling fictional world of humans, the answer is perhaps a bit more complicated than I thought. Whilst human-like robots may well be some way away, what's clear is that AI is developing at speed and we need to debate the potential pitfalls before it's too late. It's very clear that these technologies are getting better and better. I do think we have to understand that we're approaching this tipping point, this point where it's going to have a greatly amplified effect, and we need to find a way to adapt to that. The same technology can be used for good or for bad, and I think it's down to society and uh, the, the inventors of that technology and um, the public at large to make sure that it gets used for the right things. This is just the beginning.